Hey, we're beginning our series on Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth this coming Sunday. And what I thought I would do today is just share some of the context information, some of the background information about what Corinth, the city, was like, what the church at Corinth was like, how it was founded. So on Sunday, when we begin our series, um, we can we can jump right in. Uh, if you've been a part of Westway for uh, the last six and a half years, you know that this is how we spend our time, um, is talking a lot about the, co- the context and just the value and the importance of context as we jump into the text. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about Corinth and what the city itself was like, and then we're actually going to spend time reading through Acts chapter 18 together. Um, so let's talk about the city of Corinth. The city of Corinth was founded around 800 B.C., And in 146 BC, it was captured and destroyed by the Romans, um, and they would rebuild it about 100 years later. Uh, Corinth was a chief city in Greece. It was the capital of the province of Achaia, and it was located on a narrow isthmus between the Aegean and the Adriatic Seas. Um, These two seas were connected by something called the um, Diakolos, which was a road, and smaller ships could actually be portaged back and forth between the two seas, and the cargo of larger ships would be unloaded, uh, put on carts, pulled across the isthmus, and then reloaded on the other side of the isthmus. Um, There were 12 active temples in Corinth, and the largest of which was was devoted to the goddess Aphrodite. Um, She was the goddess of love, And a big part of the worship of Aphrodite at this temple in Corinth regarded um, was around making use of the thousand temple um, prostitutes that were there. Um, Corinth was was so known for its behavior because it was such a city of commerce, of of people coming and going. It really didn't have a great reputation. Um, It was so known for its behavior that the term... um, Corinthiasomai was given them. So you were a, you were Corinthiasomide, um, and it meant to act like a Corinthian. And this was not a, um, this was not a compliment to be considered um, a Corinthian. The population of Corinth was about 700,000-ish people. Uh, 250,000 of those were free people, and there were about 400,000 slaves. So Corinth is a very um, it's a very cosmopolitan city. There's a lot of things going on in Corinth. There's, um, there's a lot of wickedness going on in Corinth, a lot of sexual immorality going on in Corinth. Um, and at the same time, because Corinth was a Greek city, uh, wisdom was a very high value of the Greeks. So if you were, if you were intelligent, if you could speak uh, eloquently, if you could speak well, you were very highly regarded in the city of Corinth. So um, let's take a look at um, at Acts chapter 18. So in Acts chapter 18, we have the story of how the church at Corinth was formed. And if we were to go back a few chapters, um, <clears throat> we would remember that Paul picked up a guy named Timothy um, in Acts uh, 15 and 16. Um, Paul picked up a guy named Timothy in the cities of Lystra and Derby, and they were on a missionary journey. So if I just flip back, um, Paul and Silas and Timothy, they go to um, they go to Macedonia, uh, they get arrested there, and then Paul moves on with Silas and Timothy to Thessalonica. We talked about this just a few months ago. Um, Paul was in Thessalonica, and they they do what Paul always did, which was go to the synagogue preach in um, the city. They are chased out of Thessalonica. Uh, They move on to the city of Berea. And then Paul and Silas leave Berea and they go to um, Athens. And then after Athens, Paul um, ends up in the city of Corinth. So let's take a look here. We're just going to read from the text and we're going to talk about um, what this says as we go through the text. So this is This is Acts chapter 18. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila 
born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all the Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers, just as he was. So if we remember back to our series on Rome, um, in about 41 AD, uh, Claudius Caesar had expelled, had begun to expel all of the Jews from the city of Rome. We don't know if Priscilla and Aquila were Christians at this point. Um, we know they were Jews. Um, but one of the things we do know, and we'll talk about this when we get there, is that at some point Priscilla and Aquila have become Christians. And not only have they become Christians, but they are teachers. Um, so we will read this a little bit later in Acts 18. Paul is in Corinth. He's there with Priscilla and Aquila, and they are tent makers, so they are working together. They're spending time together. Uh, this is beginning at verse 5. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. So this is, this is Paul's uh, MO. This is the way that Paul... Um, attempts to reach the Jews is he goes in the synagogue. He always starts in the synagogue because there's a foundation of Judaism. There's a foundation of their faith. So the things that Paul is going to talk about, um, they're going to have a frame of reference for. After Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, Your blood is upon your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I'll go and preach to the Gentiles. So pretty simple, pretty easy to understand. Paul's preaching. He's teaching in the synagogue. They get tired of hearing his message, and they kick him out. So Paul's essentially says, Okay, Jews, you don't want to hear the message of Jesus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go now to the Gentiles. This is verse 7. Then he left and went to the home of Titius Justus, a Gentile who worshipped God and who lived next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. So obviously, while some of the Jews opposed and insulted him, some of the Jews became followers of Christ, including the synagogue leader, and many other people, according to what this says in Corinth, became believers and they were baptized. That's an important thing. So when we become a follower of Jesus, one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to be baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid, speak out. Don't be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. Now, this is something that's kind of new for Paul, for Paul to stay in one place at one time. Usually he would, he would drop in, he would proclaim the gospel, people would be converted, he'd be chased out of town, uh, he would move on, he'd be arrested, he'd move on. But here he's able to stay in Corinth for a long amount of time, and he's able to teach them the gospel. He's able to proclaim to them the gospel. Uh, he's able to talk to them about, about what, um, like what church should look like, uh, what it means to be a Christian. And he's able to do this in a uh, period of 18 months. Um, picking up at verse 12. But when Gallio became governor of Achaia, some Jews rose up together against Paul and brought him before the governor for judgment. They accused Paul of, and this is a quote, persuading people to worship God in ways that are contrary to our law. But just as Paul started to make his defense, Gallio turned to Paul's accusers and said, Listen, you Jews, if this were a case involving some wrongdoing or serious crime, I would have a reason to accept your case. But since it's merely a question of words and names and your Jewish law, take care of it yourselves. I refuse to judge such matters. And he threw them out of the courtroom. So one of the really cool things that we can see about this text is um, earlier in verses 9 and 10, Paul had a vision of the Lord. And the Lord said, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. I'm with you. No one's going to attack and harm you. For many people in this city belong to me. And now we see the fruition of this. God made this promise 
to Paul, made this commitment to Paul, and now Paul is brought before the governor, and the governor is like, look, I'm not going to hear this case. This is really, this is like, this is an insider thing between, between you Jews. You guys deal with this. But then verse 17 says this, the crowd grabbed Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him right there in the courtroom. But Gallio paid no attention. So what's interesting, and we're going to talk about this briefly on Sunday, is in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul writes that the letter is from Paul and from Sosthenes. So this is the same guy. Um, some people say yes, some people say no. We're not really sure. Um, if it is the same guy, what's interesting about that is apparently... Um, Corinth is the city where Jewish synagogue leaders go um, to be converted to Christianity, which is something that I really think is uh, funny and ironic. We talked about it in the staff meeting on, on Monday. <clears throat> so Paul, again, Paul has been brought before the governor in Achaia. God has told him what's going to happen and what's not going to happen, that he doesn't need to worry about it. And this promise made by God has been fulfilled. If we pick up in verse 18, it says, Paul stayed in Corinth for some time after that. We know that that time was, this is all in that 18 months. Then he said goodbye to the brothers and sisters and went to near, nearby Centria. There he shaved his head according to Jewish custom, marking the end of a vow. Then he set sail from Syria, taking Priscilla and Aquila with him. So again, if we go back to the beginning of chapter 18, we're not really sure of what the of what the relationship between Priscilla and Aquila and Jesus was. Um, maybe they were Jews and Paul converted them as they spent 18 months together um, making tents. They had to talk about something. I imagine Paul always talked about the gospel. Maybe they were Christians um, before that. But in any case, when Paul moved on, Priscilla and Aquila went with him. They stopped first in the port of Ephesus where Paul left the others behind. While he was there, he went to, no surprise, the synagogue to reason with the Jews. They asked him to stay longer, but he declined. As he left, however, he said, I will come back later, God willing. Then he set sail from Ephesus. The next stop was at the port of Caesarea. From there, he went up and visited the church at Jerusalem and then went back to Antioch. After spending time in Antioch, Paul went back through Galatia and Phrygia visiting and strengthening all the believers. So at this point, like Paul's, kind of Paul's part in the story of Corinth is, is kind of over. Like Paul has, Paul has moved on. Priscilla and Aquila have moved on. Uh, we'll lead, we'll, we would read later in Romans, um, like we did last year, that Paul is, when he writes to, um, when he writes to the church at Rome, he's going to include Priscilla and Aquila in that. Um, so what's going on in Corinth while all of this is taking place? Let's pick up the story in verse 24, Acts 18. It says this, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. So Paul and Priscilla and Aquila have moved on from Corinth. They've kind of gone to some different places. And now they're in Ephesus. And who shows up but a guy named Apollos? He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with enthusiastic spirit, with an enthusiastic spirit, and with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately. What I love so much about this text, and we talked, we've talked about it a few times um, now, Priscilla and Aquila have gone from like whatever their relationship with God was earlier in the chapter. Now they are, they've gone and they join Paul. They've been with him in all of these places. And now here is this person in, in Apollos um, who's very eloquent, very well spoken, very enthusiastic. He's coming from the city of Alexandria, which is where um, there was a great library in Alexandria. And this is where things are going to start Going, going to start to play into what Paul is going to deal with when he writes his first letter to the church at Corinth. Remembering that wisdom and knowledge and eloquent speech were very important qualities, um, were 
if you could speak well, you were very highly regarded in Greek society. And here is this person who has the wisdom, has the knowledge, has the ability to speak eloquently about the things of God. He comes into Ephesus and he's doing all of this. But there's something that he's kind of missing. The only thing he knows is John's baptism. This is something that we've talked about in the past. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. It wasn't a baptism in the Holy Spirit. So the, the baptism that, John, that Apollos is proclaiming is only John's baptism. It's only a gospel of repentance. Um, and when Priscilla and Aquila are aware of this, they took him aside, which is an important thing. Um, when someone isn't teaching, when someone is teaching an incomplete gospel, um, you don't correct them in front of everyone. It says they took him aside and explained the way of God um, more accurately. And then if we pick up um, in verse 27, Apollos had been thinking about going to Achaia and the brothers and sisters in Ephesus encouraged him to go. So Apollos now wants to go to Corinth. They wrote to the believers in Achaia, asking them to welcome him. When he arrived there, he proved to be of great benefit to those who, by God's grace, had believed. He refuted with powerful arguments in public debate. Using the scriptures, he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. So now we end Acts 18, where we started. We're back in Corinth, where Paul has gone to Corinth, I believe that he proclaimed the gospel to Aquila and Priscilla. He spent 18 months with them, not only in the church, preaching and teaching in the church and equipping the church, but preaching and teaching and equipping Aquila and Priscilla. And then by the end of the chapter, what we see is a people who have been discipled into teaching and leading are now teaching and leading other people. Specifically, they're preaching and teaching to Apollos, and now Apollos takes what he has learned, and he returns to Corinth, where he is going to preach and teach. One of the things that I really want to draw your attention to, um, there are three particular verses that I want to draw your attention to from chapter 18 of Acts um, that I really think are important. Uh, the first one is in verse 5. So this is early on in the story. After Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all of his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So Paul's message, when he is in Corinth, when he's preaching and teaching in the synagogue, Paul's message is about Jesus. If we look ahead a few verses, and we look at verse 11. So Paul stayed there in Corinth, for the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. Paul's message to the people of Corinth, as indicated by verse 5, and now indicated by verse 11, is about Jesus. Teaching the word of God, teaching from the scriptures, the importance of teaching from the scriptures. And then we get to the end of chapter 18, and we find Apollos now picking up where Paul left off, teaching and preaching in Corinth. He refuted the Jews with powerful arguments in public debate. Using the scriptures, he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. One of the things that we're going to talk about as we go, um, as we go through Corinth um, is this. There are a lot of really messed up things taking place at the church at Corinth. There's a lot of division. There's a lot of conflict going on. The, the Christians in Corinth are compromising. They're giving into um, what's happening in Corinth. Uh, in, in many ways, they are, they are more uh, Corinthian than they are Christian. And what we're going to see throughout the entire letter as, as we spend time in Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth I've said it's probably going to be nine months as we spend time in this. Uh, Paul's counter, Paul's argument to their conflict and to their compromise is to remind them 
consistently and continuously of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this won't be new to them. Their church, according to Acts 18, was founded upon the scriptures. Their church was founded upon the person of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus. Paul talked about it at the beginning when he arrives in Corinth. He spends 18 months talking about the gospel. And then after he leaves and Apollos comes in, they just talk about the gospel. So the counter to division, the counter to conflict, the counter to compromise is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm excited about for this series. As we spend the next nine months going through 1 Corinthians, um, week in and week out, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how the gospel of Jesus confronts conflict, confronts division, confronts compromise, and deals with each one of those things in a way that points people to Christ, where Jesus alone is the answer. It's not going to be found in their wisdom, as we're going to talk about. It's not going to be found in their own self-righteousness. It's not going to be found in who's a better Christian than others, but the counter to conflict and compromise is always Jesus. That's Paul's message. That's our message uh, here at Westway Christian Church, is the counter to what's wrong in the world is the gospel, is the good news of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus. And we are called as Paul is going to say, we are called to respond to that same gospel. So I'm ready to jump in with you on Sunday as we talk about 1 Corinthians. Um, I hope this was helpful, and I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Have a good rest of your week.